everybody. You are listening to Procure Smarter with Dr. Sharon Cook. Welcome. Today we are going to talk to Nicole Davison out of Australia, and she has got some tips for us on being a professional negotiator. So stay tuned for that. It's been a busy week here in South Carolina. On a personal note, my only daughter is getting married this weekend, and the family is super excited. Shout out to my daughter and future son-in-law. Can't wait to share in your big day. Also, last week, I participated in All Aboard Design by Next Events. This was a networking event held in Charleston, and I was excited to participate. I got to see several vendors that I have not had a chance to connect with since the pandemic shut us all down. And then I got to meet with lots of new vendors. I got some very sad news that Cy Hennenberg from 2nd Avenue Lighting passed away from complications of COVID. Cy was a wonderfully sweet and kind man that was at all the shows. I will miss him, and I send my thoughts to his family and co-workers. This was my first trade show since COVID began, and while I had misgivings, I'm truly glad I attended. And hats off to Michael Schneider for putting together a fun event. Now, let's talk to Nicole Davison, a negotiating expert from Australia. Well, thank you for doing this. No, it's a pleasure. So you pleasure. are joining me from quite a ways away. It is a little way away. In fact, it's a different day, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. You're you are coming from Australia. I am. Sunny, sunny Melbourne, Australia. Not too sunny today, actually. Is it really? Yeah, it's, it's a bit ordinary, but uh, that's life. Well, I thank you for doing this. I I saw your profile and I was fascinated by what you were doing. And so I would love to talk to you about your journey and like how you got to this role that you're in. Fantastic. So it's quite a long journey, actually, Sharon. So um, it's a career path I would never have guessed that I'd end up where I was. And it came after, it was, it was probably only about five years ago that I stopped feeling like I had a really flaky CV. Um, I actually started, I, I studied law and commerce at university in Melbourne. And I think I always thought I would be this high flying corporate lawyer or insolvency practitioner or something. Um, and, and that's what I did when I, when I left university, I worked in an insolvency firm. Um, so one of the top five, or it was big six back then, Arthur Anderson. Um, I left there to do um, what we have in Australia is, is a program called Articles, which is basically like an apprenticeship to become a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked in one of the top tier law firms for a year and became admitted as a solicitor, uh, which probably means something different in the US. So I became admitted as a lawyer um, and I, I never really wanted to practice law. I struggled with um, some of the technicalities of the law, not in terms of not being able to do it, but in not necessarily believing it was the most effective or efficient way to run businesses all the time. So right. I got, I found it frustrating that it was often more substance over, uh, form over substance. Right. Um, I then left and went into investment banking. So I worked um, in Australia for an investment bank for a while. I moved to London. I worked for Lehman Brothers. Um, I got very jaded with that and then ended up as a recruitment consultant. <laughs> okay. And I think I thought that by being a recruitment consultant, I'd be working to, um, uh, to help people find jobs and really working for them. And I realized that actually, no, it wasn't that. It was about selling people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your clients were the people that were paying your fee, which were the employers. And I decided it was actually the hardest sales job in the world because it's the one sales product that turns around and says, no, I don't want to be bought by them. Um, so I found that all very, it was very interesting, but also not for me. I ended up going back into insolvency because it, out of all the things that I'd done up to that stage, I loved the variety and the challenges of seeing a whole lot of different industries and working out how they work. So that was great. And it was while I was back in insolvency, I was working with Ernst & Young. They sent us off on a leadership development program. Okay, and, stop right there because I, I want to yeah. kind of, I, we haven't told people what exactly you do. Ooh. <laughs> so let's do this. 
you are a lawyer by trade, by qualification, uh, right? I am. But you actually offer mediator and facilitator coaching, right? So that's absolutely right. So I am, so I'm a specialist in negotiation. So I will come in and mediate disputes as an independent neutral, um, whether there are lawyers involved in those disputes or not. I'll work alongside um, organisations to help them come up with strategies for their negotiations. So I'll work for a particular party on a negotiation to help them plan that negotiation so they've got the best chance of getting the best outcome possible. Uh, and then I do a lot of training work in the negotiation and conflict management space as well. So, so I that's, think that's what I do now. Fascinating. So tell me how, like, did you see an ad in the paper? Did you, did you go to a <laughs> conference and you're like, I think I can do this? Like what, what ticked in you that said, this is something I want to do? So it, it wasn't anything so obvious. I think, um, as I said before, I went to this leadership development program, which taught me that I wanted to be working to help people. And it was really a process of evolution. So initially I did some retraining um, and took a role with a law firm as their learning and development manager. And that led me to a couple of other similar roles. Eventually I got a, a role with a training consultancy where I was teaching things like, you know, basic communication skills, presentation skills, um, effective influence, um, all of these sort of good communication skills that we need in the workplace. I loved what I was doing. I loved making a difference for people, but I felt like I wasn't an expert in what I was teaching. And I then moved to a consultancy that just taught negotiation. And I loved this consultancy because it was right down my alley because the first seven weeks that I was with them, I didn't get to see a client. I was actually just learning negotiation theory and getting a deep theoretical understanding of what I was going to be teaching. Wow. After I, after I taught for a couple of years and I really loved that, um, I decided that the teaching wasn't enough for me. I needed to be doing and teaching because I felt like as a, as a trainer, I wasn't being authentic because I was telling people to do all of this stuff, but I wasn't putting it into practice myself in the same environment that they were. So that's where becoming a mediator came from because the mediation is really facilitating other people's negotiations. And so I had the understanding of the negotiations. I wanted to really help people with that. And so that's where I decided um, to go and do my mediation accreditation. And then I left the consultancy that I was with so I could set up a practice that was both teaching and doing. That is amazing. So on your bio, I, I did, I tried to do a deep dive of you. On your bio, <laughs> you have an Andy Warhol quote. And it, yes. it says, I'm impressed with people who can create new spaces with the right words. So yeah. why did you choose that quote? I, I saw that quote at an exhibition that was um, at the National Gallery of Victoria. Um, and I chose it because I think it really represents that we've got to look at things differently, particularly in a conflict scenario. It's sometimes about reframing the way that we see things, reframing the way that we say things. And just creating a bit of space for you to actually stop and reflect on what's going on in the world and what that actually means. Right. So now, in, in how many years have you been doing this now? So I've been running my business with the mixed practice. I'm in my fifth year and I've been teaching negotiation for about 10 in total. Wow. And have you ever come across um, a situation where you didn't think a compromise could be reached? Uh, absolutely. And, and there are times where the interests of parties are just so divergent um, that it's not possible to get to an outcome. And that's what I always say, and particularly when I start my training courses, I say I don't have a magic wand that finds a solution in every situation. But what I do have is a really strategic approach to make sure that if you don't get to an outcome, it's because it's not possible, not because you've missed something. So there are absolutely times where you just can't reconcile the interests of the parties 
and there is no way that you're going to satisfy both. Um, right. No, no, but, I was just gonna say, uh, sometimes the best solution is to walk away. Absolutely, and this is part of the processes I look at because um, one of the other challenges that I see is people investing so much time in a negotiation um, that they forget that there's other things that they could be doing. So one of the things that we talk about in negotiation is know what your alternatives are. So if, if I think about your world in the procurement space in hospitality, I might be trying to do a deal with one particular supplier and I might be investing a whole lot of time and effort in trying to get them somewhere, but there's resistance and it's not working and I'm pushing harder and I'm pushing harder, but I'm not getting there. What I need to be doing is having a really clear idea of what are my other options? You know, if I don't deal with this supplier, are there other suppliers? Are there other um, places that I could go? Could I change the product that I'm using? Um, how well does that meet my interests compared to getting a deal done with this party? Because eventually, if you've, got an, if you've got an alternative and you're clear about what that is, that sets the walk away position in the negotiation. If I can't get something that's at least as good as that, then I walk away. But, you know, I've seen people invest months and months of time, which when we've then come and looked at that analysis of what's their alternative and what's the, what's the other party's alternative, we realise that actually there's no scope for a deal to be done here because they've got people offering them more than what I'm offering. Um, and there's just, there's just no way, given that I can't offer more because of where I can, what I can source elsewhere, there's just no way that we're gonna get a deal done. So part of it is not just about getting the outcomes, but it's about being efficient in the process and not wasting time. Right. So I noticed on some of your Instagram posts, you're a big believer in using the word no. Absolutely. <laughs> what, yes. Talk to me about that. What is, how powerful is the word no? Look, it's absolutely critical because, um, and, and it depends on where I work. So I work at both an organizational level and an individual level. And I think for me, the no comes a lot at the individual level because there's a lot of us and, and I was the same. And I think this is one, one of the things why it's so important to me. I was a people pleaser. I never wanted to say no to people and I wasn't very good at saying no to people. Um, so I'd find myself overcommitted. I'd find myself resentful of saying, th you know, saying yes to things I didn't really want to say um, yes to. And so that power of saying no in terms of not only getting good outcomes, but in being satisfied in your own um, being is really important. But, you know, for, for people who are people pleasers or who are conflict avoiders, um, knowing how to say no is the real challenge. And that's, that's one of the things I look at is how do you actually do that effectively? Right. Okay, so now let's talk about something I know you start, you're getting ready to start is a podcast. Absolutely. So your podcast, let's see here, um, you're launching a podcast November 1st? Correct. So tell yes. me about it. So the idea of the podcast, it's called Negotiation in Real Life. And what I wanted to do is, you know, obviously I've read a whole lot of negotiation theory and I'm really, you know, I, I call myself an expert in negotiation but it's boring just to hear the theory. So I'm reaching out to people who have been in those negotiations, the ones that worked, some of the ones that didn't work as well. And I'm getting them to share their stories for people because often we don't talk about those experiences of negotiations, but I want people to be able to hear those stories. And then um, from the discussion that I have with people about their stories, we pull out examples of the theory in real practice that people can take away and replicate in their own negotiations. Right. So it's been lots of fun. Okay, so is there, in, in the time that you've been doing this, is there one negotiation that stands out in your mind that was like your moment to like, you just, it was just a really good deal that got, that got resolved? Um, that is a great question. And, and it's interesting because I work mainly with other people's negotiations rather than my own. Right. Um, but there's a few interesting challenges that have um, come up along the way. And, you know, one of the ones that sticks in my mind for a number of reasons was actually a court case that I was mediating and it was a defamation case. Um, and one of the challenges that came up um, a gentleman had been accused of defaming a local councillor 
in Melbourne. And he'd been putting uh, posts up on a Facebook group. And he didn't deny that he'd put the posts up. Um, he didn't deny that, um, you know, he had intended to do so. He thought that they were true, but, you know, they were very much, he was at risk of, of a finding against him. Um, but he disclosed to me in private session that he actually um, had a terminal illness. Wow. And this was going to be really relevant to the court case. Um, now, he thought it was going to go in his favour because he thought, well, if I'm dead, they can't sue me. Um, and he didn't realise that they could still sue his estate. And in fact, he wouldn't be there to defend himself. So it was potentially worse for his family. Um, but he disclosed this fact to me. His son-in-law was there. He said, I haven't even told the family yet that I'm going to be dead in three months. And his son-in-law sitting there going, what? Um, so I had to firstly, you know, respond to this terrible piece of news and deal with that first before we went back into problem solving mode. Um, but it was really interesting because he didn't want the other person to know this, but it was important information to get across in order to get a deal done that day. So I had to come up with a strategy for how do we actually convince the other side that there's a real reason to get this resolved. And he, he decided then he really wanted it resolved. Um, but how can I do that without disclosing that he's Right. Um, you know, only got a little while to live. So we worked out a method where I could actually disclose that he had health issues, but I couldn't disclose what it was. So I went into the other room in private session and we went through a whole, I said, there's health issues. I can't tell you which one it is, um, but I want you to guess what it is and see how that goes. And they said, okay, well, firstly, they went, oh, he's got cancer. We'll have to defer everything while he's going through chemo. This is what it'll look like. I said, if it wasn't that, what else could it be? And we took them through about six different variations. Of course, once they, they um, guessed, oh, he's gonna die, I made them keep going after that. But it was really good to see how that process, um, one of the challenges that often comes up in negotiation is people have things that they don't wanna share. So that idea about finding ways to share that information to get the resolution, I think it was a really, um, it was an experience that really stuck with me because I thought at the beginning, there's no way we can do this. Um, and yet we were able to then find a way to share the right feeling of the information without sharing the information itself. So you don't really think about how emotional negotiations can actually become. You know, that, that, you know, on a business sense, you think, oh, you should leave your heart out of it. It's just purely business. But it's a really yeah. hard thing to do, isn't it? Well, it, it's an impossible thing to do because we're all human. And I think this is what's really interesting. Often I talk to lawyers and they're like, well, we, we help because it's all about the, the, the beauty of mediation is you get, the, you get the opportunity for them to vent some of the emotional anguish and sometimes just the fact that they get to say their piece to the other person is enough for them to get past it. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the fact that they might get an apology, um, but you know, you can't turn the emotional part of your brain off. And even though it's a business transaction, there's so much ego that's involved in business transactions. You know, sometimes it's not about the results at a company, but it's about, I'm just coming up for a promotion. And if I don't get a really good deal on this one, I'm going to miss out. Yeah. Um, and that's where, you know, particularly once again, when you're dealing with procurement and, and large organisations, you've got people whose own um, independent interests actually don't even align with the corporate interests. This deal would be good for the client, but because of the KPIs of the, um, the sales team, they don't want to do it because it mucks up their KPIs, even though for the organisation as a whole, it might work. Right. Um, so, you know, once again, planning and, and trying to understand the dynamics of what's going on and, and helping people, um, you know, help the other side to get what they need so that you can get what you need. I agree. I, I have a thing that I say on my website that, that, a, that a really good negotiation, both parties walk away with something. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, there, there shouldn't be a winner or a loser. Everybody should get something in the negotiation. Yeah. And I think particularly when you're talking commercial transactions, um, you know, the, the kinds of negotiations that you're dealing with in procurement are often long-term relationships. So there absolutely has to be something in both 
parties' pockets at the end of the day because otherwise you're going to go somewhere else. Well, yeah, um, and I don't know, I'm sure you know this, but business people can get their feelings heard just as much as anybody else. You know, if they felt like yes. they got a bad deal, um, you know, you, it's almost impossible to continue that relationship. Absolutely. And I'm doing a mediation at the moment. We're halfway through where it's all to do with the fact that the way that the way that a change to the contract was communicated upset the client they terminated the relationship and, and now it's all gone to pot because they terminated in a way that upset the others. And it's nothing to do with the commercial realities of that transaction, right. but they're just now feeling, you know, feeling hurt. Yeah. So let's come back to your podcast for a second. How often mm. do you intend to drop episodes? So the podcast is going to be done in seasons. So it's going to be weekly episodes over 10 weeks and then we'll have a break in between seasons and come back for, for the next season. So that's, that's the plan. Um, I've certainly got all of my episodes lined up for season one, which is coming out on the 1st of November and um, working. There's, there's a number of guests already lined up, ready to go for getting season two ready. So with season one, did you, was this a, I mean, you know, I just started this podcast and it was a huge learning process. Like yes. <laughs> learning how to do a podcast was a whole nother skill. Was there something that surprised you about learning this skill? Um, not, I'm trying to think, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm doing all of the back end of the podcast myself. Um, I, I think it's, it's quite a good thing. I've got quite an interest in technology and I quite like, um, playing around with all of these different pieces of software. So I'm doing all of the editing, all of the graphic design. Um, it's been a real fun process. It's quite time consuming though. So it really you know, is. to get, to get a, an episode and I do as little editing as possible, but even to take a half hour episode and polish that up and make it sound good and then draft the documentation that goes with it, it's, it's quite a labor. If you could have anybody on your podcast, living or alive, who would be your dream guest? Oh, now that is a great question. Um, there's certainly um, some of the team from the Harvard Program on Negotiation I'd love to have on to interview, but they don't really fit with my negotiation stories of somebody who's actually been through. So, um it's a really good question, actually, and I, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> it's a stumper. We'll come back to it. All right. So <laughs> let me just, let, let's put out there, if somebody wants to hear this and wants to reach you, like, how do you prefer people reach out to you? Um, the podcast um, will be available on Spotify, Google Play, all major um, podcast hosts, um, and that will be coming out um, on 1 November. And um, LinkedIn is also a great way to connect with me. And I'm always happy to take on um, connections from LinkedIn. I love it. All right, Nicole, I'm going to ask you to repeat one more time your website address because we had a little lag there for a second. I want to make sure that we get it live on the podcast. Fantastic. So the website is um, NicoleDavidsonNegotiation.com.au. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about what you do over there in Australia? What are your hobbies? Uh, well, at the moment, not much because I'm in Melbourne where we've now spent about 255 days in lockdown. Oh, um, so there's a lot of things that we're not doing at the moment. But um, aside from that, I've got three kids that keep me busy. I've got a 14 year old daughter and 12 year old twin boys. Um, so they keep me pretty busy. And um, I do, in fact, one of my COVID um, hobbies was I got involved in making resin art. So using a bit of the creative side of my brain um, to do nice. that has been lots of fun. Well, thank you very much for doing this. Thank very you happy. so much, Nicole. It's been a pleasure, Sharon. I look forward to it. Have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Thanks. You have been listening to Procure Smarter, sponsored by my company, Procure Smart. I'm Dr. Sharon Cook. If you are looking for professional FF&E purchasing services, please give us a try. We are small, but we are very aggressive on pricing, and we have over 24 years of experience to back it up. Please check out our website at www.procuresmartco.com. You can also check us out on LinkedIn or Instagram.
we like to hear from you. If you'd like to be a sponsor of the podcast, hey, reach out to me. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, that's even better. Definitely reach out to me. You can schedule time with us directly from our website. Thank you again for spending some time with us today. And until next week, go out and be brave and be adventuresome. Goodbye, everybody.